this uh, is going to kind of spring off of Marcia's ministry. When we got home last week, we talked about it. And I said, I said, uh, while you were talking, I was hearing uh, the scripture in Mark and Matthew about hearers of the word. And I said, I'll teach that because she has another thing she wants to teach. And it's going to turn out to be two parts. And hopefully she'll follow me the last time and finish her message. It is so much fun in the spirit to minister and hear God finish a message um, as somebody is talking. And, and Marcy and I have such a close relationship that I can, uh, she and I could teach together right here. And uh, we used to do that years ago, and it was fun. Uh, but she's, she's an amazing preacher, and I love that God has shared her with us. And she will be back on a monthly basis starting the first of the year. So uh, know that she's, she's heard from the Lord, and she physically feels well enough to make that drive. And so she will be here one Sunday a month starting in January. Praise God. Amen. You have a handout. You can see it's Hearers of the Word, part one. Well, what I want to do is share with you uh, about the parable of the sower. And this has been taught over the years, and you've heard it over the years by numerous ministers, if you enjoy listening to other men and women teach. And the reason this is so important is because the Bible says that if you do not understand the parable of the sower, how will you understand other parables? So if we don't work, if you will, by grace on understanding what Jesus was speaking during this time, it's going to be difficult for us to get the revelation that we need to hear him speak again and again and again. And that's why this is, this is something that you should go back and forth with. Read it in Matthew, then come in and read it in Mark. And I'm going to read out of Mark today. And um, you will be surprised at what you learn every time you read it. Because I, I have taught this. I heard this, I don't know how many years ago. And I still get something when I restudy it. It's amazing how God's spirit works. I just, I love that he is alive. Do y'all know he's alive? He is alive. The body of Christ should be advancing in their understanding of God's kingdom. And God's mystery is revealed to the body of Christ. What we've got to begin to understand is that God made provision for us to have revelation knowledge now about how the kingdom works. Yes, it's good to listen to people teach about the kingdom. We, we listened to Miles Monroe, um, got a lot of his books during the time that he really was really advancing uh, the kingdom of God and its principles. And, and in that, though, you've got, you've got to listen to the Spirit tell you what is he wanting to advance in you. That's the key. What is he wanting you to know about what's going on right now? Uh, let me let me read something to you real quick, if I may. I hadn't planned on reading this, obviously. But it's found in Luke 17. Let me just do that. You guys can just listen while I thumb through this. Maybe. Praise God. <laughs> Luke 17, verse 20 and 21. Jesus said that in, this himself. He said, now when... He was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will it say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within inside of you. So where's the kingdom of God? Over there, in town, at that church, through that preacher? No, it's in you. So if you want revelation, which we do, then we have to communicate with him and let him communicate to us what it is he's telling us. It's perfect. Perfect way to deal with stuff. I don't want to talk to Sherry about Tom if I want Tom to change. Right? 
No, I need to talk to Tom if I want things to change. Amen. Amen. Okay, you ready to hook up? Because I'm going to read, which is a challenge in itself. Mark 4. I'm going to get it up here where I can see it this time. I'm going to skip around a little bit. So if you want to just listen, that might be the best thing to do. Jesus says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. <clears throat> and then he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now I'm going to jump over to 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterwards, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty and some a hundred. Thank you God for a new understanding today of what Jesus was speaking to the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, because we understand this parable, we will understand other things, and you will reveal other mysteries to us as we continue to grow in our understanding of you. Amen, amen. So these two areas here where Jesus begins to speak, and then he begins to define what it is he's saying, should cause us to take a greater look at exactly what is he saying? What is he saying about us, about this mystery of the kingdom being revealed in us? And I gave you some really short examples because there are four different things that Jesus mentions here. And what I want us to see today is that the four different things may mean all of us experience these four different things at one time or another in our understanding of who Jesus is. These aren't necessarily four different people, okay? They're our ability to hear when the Spirit of God is speaking to us and what we do with what we hear. One of the key things on the scripture, and this is so important, church, they all heard. They all heard. So every time we hear, we can have this type of reaction to what it is the Spirit of God is saying to us. Amen? Because a lot of times you think, well, I don't do that or I don't do that. But the point is, you hear and what do you do with what you hear? That's the point. That's the point of the teaching today. And, and it will speak to all of us in one way or another. Uh, the wayside, simply put, hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. Hears it, 
wayside. It says it's sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Here's what I think the word is saying, because in Matthew it says wicked, not Satan. And one thing that's important about that is to understand that when you define the word Satan or even wicked, you're coming up with an accuser. The accuser comes in immediately. What does the accuser do? He opposes. What is he opposing? What you heard. Amen? And so the word Satan is defined adversary. So anybody that has an adversary has somebody that is pulling against them so they can accomplish what it is that God is saying or doing. And, and wicked is this, has the same connotation to it. So when you see the word Satan, particularly um, in our own minds now, believing that, that Satan was defeated at the cross according to Scripture and that he was put under the Lord Jesus Christ's feet and we were anointed as overcomers to live abundantly and above and beyond what we can dream or imagine. When you think of that and you have this thought come into your life, when you get the word and, it's, and you're on the wayside, you're going to hear a voice in your head that says, you can't do that. What are they doing? Opposing what you heard. Pulling against what you hear. And accusing you, opposing you. So that you won't follow through with what it is you've heard. We ought to write a list of those things that we've heard. Or read what we've written and see if we've done it. Amen. And the stony place hears the word of the kingdom and receives it immediately. But only endures for a short while. And then stumbles when living as a believer doesn't go the way they think it should. One of the most exciting things in the world is to hear the word, right? And get excited about what you hear. It says with gladness. You receive it with gladness. How many times have you heard the Lord say something to you and you were pumped? And you were really pumped about it. And then you find out you didn't do what you heard. It just was exciting. Right, God talked to me. He said blah, 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 blah. blah. And you're going, yay, what are you doing now? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But when that believer stumbles is because the application of what you hear isn't always immediate, but it will come. And will you remember what you heard? Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Amen? And then the thorns. That's the, uh, the thorn hears the word but is overwhelmed with life's cares and is spiritually unfruitful. I think that's one of the most um, profound things that happens to all of us as a, as a believer, is that we, we do hear the word, but we are so overwhelmed with life and life's circumstances that we find out we're not spiritually capable of bearing the fruit that's required of us because it requires faith to bear fruit. When you are going through life struggles and challenges, it is so important to be around people of like faith. That's why I encourage you to pray for those that are not here and people that you know that are struggling because they are out there. They literally are out there. And, and life is not doing for them what they want, want it to do. And church, we are the link that will hold them in place if we'll allow the Spirit of God to tell us who it is we need to pray for. Because it's not always about us. So much of the time we want to make everything about us. But when you don't have any root in yourself, literally a root is when that seed settles in and becomes part of your natural behavior. You have roots when you don't have to think about some of the things that you believe, right? There is nobody that can tell me ever that God is not a good God. Because I know he is, regardless of life and what life has dealt me. I know God is a good God. I am settled in that. The roots are deep. Faith is deep in that area. But it's not in every area. 
And that's what the Spirit of God was speaking to me. Yes, you may have this, but what about this area? Where are you in this area in believing that I'm as good as you know I am in every situation that you don't see turn out the way you want it to? Amen? <clears throat> Let's see. And then we have, uh, did I do thorns? That was the one I just did. Good ground. This is a cool one. Good grounds, hears the words, and guess what he does? He understands it. And when you understand something, what do you do? You implement it. When you implement it, you're putting down roots. If I know that I hear the word and, and my, my spirit, my spirit is tilled, my spirit is sensitive, I'm not overcome with doubt or guilt or inferiority, I'm not angry at anybody, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm open. And when I'm open, my heart is tender before the Lord. And seed can be dropped. Seed can be dropped. And I have seed in me and you have seed in you that hasn't come harvest time yet. We have seed in us that the roots are growing. And as the roots grow, what you'll see is your behavior changes. When the roots go down, you are implementing what you heard maybe six months ago. Maybe five years ago you heard something and all of a sudden you understand exactly what God was saying. And we all learn through tribulation. We all learn through tests and trials. And during those times, we learn where we lack so that our roots will go deeper. Amen? So don't think that just because you don't see what it is you've been hoping for, don't give up. It could be softly planted in your spirit, and God is saying, in due season, you will reap a harvest. Believe. Just believe. Continue to believe. And any time you get something, I know that's what I love about Martha, is Martha writes it down and does some great explaining as she hears the Spirit of the Lord. And she can go back years later and look at what the Lord told her, and she sees the answer today. That is so amazing. It's really amazing to me. So many in the body of Christ hear the word, which is the seed of kingdom principles. They live out those principles, which produces more fruit whose seed is in itself. Your behavior is seed when you live it out. And when you live out, I'm using my fingers, when you live out the seed, what you're, what you're wanting is in the seed. The seed produces after its own kind. Is it faith? You can respond. You'll have more faith. Is it bitterness? You'll have more bitterness. Is it forgiveness? It'll grow easier to forgive. I could just go down the list of things that apply to this. And, and what we have to do is hook up to the reality of seed being planted. And it's going to do one of these four things. And we can find why we're not bearing the fruit that we want to bear. Check the fruit. What are you harvesting today or not harvesting that you're believing for? Amen? So the seed is in itself, which will produce more. More love, more mercy, more kindness. Those are the principles of the kingdom. All of kingdom principles have seed in it to produce after itself when you implement it, when I implement it. I can't have anything that I haven't put a seed in the ground, my heart. Amen? I know Sherry has a song. Oh, man, this is such a good song. Yeah, anyway, didn't think of that one, sis. Um, and it goes on to say, uh, the believer who isn't a hearer only and a doer of the word will bear fruit so part two you hear part one part two you do implement it 
Amen? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, translated, I did this, this is my translated here, is the believer has conformed to the image of Christ, therefore he is abundantly fruitful. How many of you want to be abundantly fruitful? Amen. It should be something that we desire. It should be something that we should die, desire. I know one of the greatest areas uh, for me as a young woman was to move beyond unforgiveness. To move beyond that and that not be a part of my everyday life, right? And, and in that, it had to do with being judgmental. I came from a family that didn't mind telling you why you were wrong. Were they right? No. <laughs> Not always. Did they think they were right? Always. Always. But as I, as I assimilated that early training as a young woman, it was easy not to forgive because you'd already judged them wrong. So when you judge somebody from, now I'm talking about Paulette, when you judge somebody wrong, you don't even think about forgiving them. They were wrong. Period. But when you have the seed, God's seed, love, which the Bible says was shed abroad in our hearts by the presence of the Holy Spirit, you begin to change. And when you begin to change, you soften. You don't have the hard ground. You don't have the stony ground. You don't have the cares of the world choking out that seed of love. The seed of love is manifesting itself in whatever area God is dealing with you about. Believe it. And when he dealt with me, again, as a young woman, we lived in California, I began to cry over the people that I had a problem with. I was so touched by God's love for them when I was so angry with them. And before I knew it, I had nothing. I had nothing. And I have never picked that up since I was a young woman. I have never gone back and embraced those hard feelings. I do not with anybody today. Right? You understand? That's my principle. That's my principle. And in that, the love of God, which was shed abroad in my heart, tenderizes my earth. I have good soil. And when I have good soil, it's easy for me to get revelation on how God wants me to do what he wants me to do. Amen? I have other areas that I deal with, like everybody. And God is continually saying, let me show you. Let me teach you. Implement this. I hear. I hear. But sometimes the cares of the world get in the way of my hearing and however it manifests itself in me. But when we begin to practice this principle that I am conforming, you are conforming to the image of Christ and you will be abundantly fruitful. And it says 30-fold. When you study 30 out, it means one who has conformed or accepted the principles of the kingdom of God. This is not a contest. This is not, well, I've got to get down here to a hundredfold. Yay, let's hope we do. But this is about what happens when you begin to listen to the Spirit of the Lord and allow that seed to plant in good, soft soil that you will bear fruit on. And the fruit is what will change your actions. The harvest is actionable. It's behavioral. You will begin to think differently, therefore you will do differently. Amen? So 30-fold is one who has conformed and accepted the principles of the kingdom of God. 60-fold occurs after complying with kingdom principles, thus reflecting his image. So with every step 
of life changes, there are areas that all of us will do a hundredfold. We will. I know that. And what we want is to begin to change in a steady fashion so that a hundredfold occurs when there is enough fruitfulness to be filled to capacity or fullness or enough to feed yourself while still experiencing an increase. When you can feed yourself and then have enough left over to still feed others, you are living the hundredfold life. You are living the hundredfold life. And there were so many examples given as I studied this and read after other authors. And I think the important thing is whatever we're lacking in, we need growth. If it's, if it's attitude, we need growth. If it's a lack of compassion, we need growth. And I'm going to give you one specific area that I believe is the root cause for many people not changing their behavior. Many, many people don't understand this principle. And I want to share it with you because I think it's so important right now. But as we change, we have capacity or fullness to feed ourselves and then help others. If all you do is take care of yourself, you're not doing the, you're not, you're not practicing the kingdom of God and its principles. And I don't mean you, you. I mean human beings. If we are not giving back out of our surplus, whatever that is, a kind word, um, um, money, um, compassion, mercy, whatever it is that we're not extending to others means that we don't have enough. If I can't extend mercy, I don't have enough mercy. If I can't extend compassion, I don't have enough compassion. And what we do when we don't have enough is we hang on to it. I have enough for me, but I don't have enough for you. How shameful is that? But if we're not a hearer and a doer of the word, we don't even understand that principle. Do we? No, we don't. We really don't. But we're learning. The important thing is we're learning. And I said there are many reasons why we struggle with manifesting, manifesting the principles of the kingdom. One reason... And this is, this is what I want to focus on the next couple of times I teach. This will give you greater compassion for other people, church. I want you all to look at me. There are people that you and I deal with daily that are wounded. And they're wounded and love the Lord. And they take one step forward and are knocked back five. Those are the people that many of us have influence over. And when we learn how to put ourselves second and their needs first, we are advancing the kingdom of God, right? And so learned helplessness occurs when a person has experienced a specific series of adverse events over which they have no control despite their best efforts to improve the situation. Many reasons that we struggle and can't manifest these principles is that we are repeatedly faced with uncomfortable situations that seem random, unavoidable, and not necessarily because of our behavior. Life seems just too hard to try. You know anybody that way? I do. I do. And if we don't move in the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can get extremely frustrated with people that refuse to get out of the mess they're in to change their life. But if they don't hear, they can't change. Right? If they don't hear, they can't change. So over time, this person may begin to believe that no matter what they do, bad things will happen from time to time, randomly, and then unexpectedly. Dysfunction arises when a person's negative experiences are generalized to their broader situation or outlook. I want to give you a definition of learned helplessness. It's a clinical term. It's a term that Christians should understand when dealing with people that can't get out of the mess they're in. 
Amen? Is when a person begins to believe that they have no control over a situation and their life for that matter, matter when they do. I can't control my life. I can't control my home. I can't control my children. I can't control my partner. I can't control my finances. My car won't work. My refrigerator burned up. My electricity was shut off. I'm three months behind in my water bill. I have no control over that. I can't get caught up. I try to get caught up, but I can't stay caught up. That's learned helplessness. Church, without the Lord Jesus Christ actively working in people's individual lives, meeting them where they are, this goes on for years and years and years. We as believers can interrupt those lives with the mercy and the grace of God, always hanging on and saying, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And being there because you can't control people that won't get out of their messes. They have to be taken out by the Spirit of God and then change can happen and you need to be there. I need to be there. We need to be there. We hook a rope into those that aren't here today. We, we have to hang on to those that you don't see sitting in these chairs and know what they're doing today. We don't judge them because they're out there in left field. We hang on to them in faith knowing they've learned some things that tell them you will never make it. Quit trying. Stay where you're at. You can't change. This won't change. And you and I know better. Isn't that exciting? So I gave you a definition of dysfunction because we all are a little bit dysfunctional in case you don't know that. <laughs> some of us are working on some issues better than other issues. Some of us have a lot of work to do and a lot of issues, right? <laughs> Dysfunction, I'm going to read this again. Dysfunction arises when a person's negative experiences are generalized to their life or outlook. Feeling things will never change for them, and what's the point in trying? I can't tell you the hundreds of people that have come across my path that you love, you support, you do all that you can do, but they are the ones that have to change their environment. They have to take that step. We have loved people and supported people not only physically but financially. I've had people live with me, live in the East Wing. Some of you know what that is. I've had them live with me, get off of drugs, get the medicine they need while I'm taking care of them, and by golly, as soon as they got they went right back to it. But do you stop? No, you don't stop. You may need to take a break because it's overwhelming. <laughs> First thing you want to do is smack them. You know? Pop, just a little pop. Not a hard pop, just a little pop. Snap out of it, right? Yeah. And so the word dis, D-Y-S, in front of a word means diseased or faulty, difficult, are painful, unfavorable, or harmful. So when you meet people like I just discussed, they're not all that dramatic, but most of the people I've dealt with are pretty dramatic. Pretty dramatic. And know that, <laughs> I want to say it's not their fault. It is, but it isn't, Donna. It is because they're not hearing in such a way that they honestly believe that they can change the situation. If you're with a domineering partner that has intimidated the living goodness out of you, it is very hard to get the courage to rise up against that intimidating partner and say, knock it off. Knock it off. It's very intimidating for a woman with several children to get the courage to get up and leave when she doesn't have enough money to take care of herself and depends on Mr. Lovely to help support the children. 
All of those are real viable issues that the body of Christ should never, ever forget exists. We may have a handle on our world. We may have pulled away from addiction. We may have pulled away from abuse. We may have pulled away from so many things. But it doesn't mean we don't turn back around and help. Exactly. And there's nobody any better to talk to somebody than somebody that's lived it. When it's personal, it's powerful. It's powerful, but it is tiring. It is exhausting. And we can only do what the Spirit of God gives us the grace to do, right? And if you run out of energy, God is saying, I've lifted the grace. You need to back off. You need to back off, right? And so I gave you a motto. The motto for the person who suffers from learned helplessness is, What's the point in trying? What's the point in trying? Right? And we know that. We know that. And so, unfortunately, the person who has been conditioned is knowingly, now listen to this so that you'll understand, okay, what God is saying to us today. N knowingly waiting for something or someone to improve their life situation. In the deepest recesses of their being, this person does not know. I must take control of my life. And I decide what I will allow, what's to happen to me. I will stand up and I will con take control of myself. And I will bring about the needed changes that need to be made. When you know that, when you've lived that, you are ready to help somebody else come out. Doesn't matter what it is. But if you fall back into learned helplessness, once you've been delivered, it is so sneaky. Pretty soon you find out that your weakness gets you attention. Many weak women enjoy the attention of being needy. I don't know about men. I don't have a needy man. Right? Hmm? <laughs> no, no. But, but do you hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today, church? Are you hearing what he's saying today? And it's your witness, it's your, it's your story that matters to the person that I'm talking about. Right? So our goal is to get people to understand, as God tries to get us to understand, you bring about the change you want to see in others. You want to see people change in this area or that area? Have you changed? Where's the seed that I've planted that you're demanding others to bear fruit of? Are you bearing fruit? Are you sharing what you've learned? Do you have the tolerance and the patience that you need to be with people that are not where you are now? Not always. Not always. Sometimes we get too comfortable in our own deliverance. And we're not willing to be there for somebody else that needs it. Amen? Sometimes all you can do is be there. Just be there. Read a text and pray. Say, oh my God, this is such a deep hole. Lord, you're the only one that can get this person out of this hole. I cannot get this person out of this hole. I can respond in love and I can be there when asked, but I can't do anything to fix this. God, you can. I can't. But I can love. I can be patient. I can be kind. I can be tolerant. I can keep my big mouth shut. I know you guys don't have that problem. Quit laughing, you two. Okay. I'm going to give you a story. You ready for a story? And with this story, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close. I've got two stories, one, one now and one next time. Are you ready? Just, li just listen. <clears throat> a short story. That's what I have it titled. Elephant trainers in Asia 
show us how being conditioned works. All right? One, they take an untrained elephant and chain it by its leg to a sturdy tree. Rage is the elephant's response, but to no avail. And the elephant cannot change his situation. So he's chained to the situation. And his reaction to being changed is rage. I can't get loose from this. I want out of this. But I'm chained to this situation. This is the elephant. When she, when she tires of fighting, when she tires of fighting, wanting out, wanting loose, the chain is replaced by a heavy rope. The animal kicks and jerks a few times and does what? Gives up. Gone from rage, let me loose, let me loose, let me loose, to a couple of jerks, a couple of sounds, and then gives up. The rope is replaced with a heavy cord, and the animal gives a half-hearted tug, and again gives up. Number four, the cord is replaced with a symbolic ribbon, and the animal will wait patiently for her master to untie the ribbon before she feels free to move. Jesus is wanting to loose some people. We are the tools for that to happen. This has nothing to do with an elephant's intelligence. Have you ever said they're too dumb to breathe? Of course you haven't. Are they as dumb as a rock? Of course you haven't. Some of us have. Now listen carefully. This has nothing to do with the elephant's intelligence because they are intellectual creatures. Instead, it concerns the craftiness of the gradual and subtle way of learning helplessness. It has been said that intelligent animals can, be some, can sometimes be conditioned more quickly. People that are locked up in a situation that they can't get free of has nothing to do with intellectual functioning. It has to do with being trained to yield to being uncomfortable. Amen. Life changes us without realizing we have been conditioned to lie down. Believing even if we try hard, we cannot change this. So we'll do nothing and just let it happen again and again and again. And you know what ends up happening? You just get old. You just get old. The example of the untrained elephant's conditioning is very straightforward. The chain produced rage. The heavy rope produced kicks and jerks. The cord produced half-hearted tugs. The symbolic ribbon produces waiting patiently to be told what to do, what to feel, what to think, and don't make waves. Church, we are the church. You and I are the church. And we must begin to use our skills related to our own deliverances to help others who are not able to help themselves because they've learned how to remain helpless in their current life situation. Amen? Are you ready for the task? Are you ready for the task? I think we are. I think we are. And I think it's time for us to look 
like we are advancing God's kingdom here on the earth. And we do that by showing God's love and mercy and his grace toward others that are not where we are based on his love and grace and patience toward us. Amen. How many of you want to raise your hand and say, Father, I will move forward in helping where you tell me to help and being kind and compassionate to those who have learned how to be helpless. I thank you, Father. Through the anointing, your anointing will destroy the yokes of those that are entrapped right now. Thank you, Father, for who you are, for your patience in delivering us as we participated in our own deliverance. And the church said amen.